please follow along to turn to me to, on, to the Bible on 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 8. Although we live in the world, we don't fight our battles with human methods. Our weapons that we fight with aren't human, but instead they are powered by God, by God for destruction of fortresses. They destroy arguments and every defense that is raised up to oppose the knowledge of God. They capture every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Once your obedience is complete, we are ready to punish any disobedience. Look at what is right in front of you. If anyone is sure about belonging to Christ, that person should think again. We belong to Christ just like the, that person. Even if I went on to brag about our authority, I wouldn't be ashamed of it. The Lord gave us that authority to build you upon and not destroy you. This is what the word of the God, this is the word of God for the people of God. So friends, in the last few weeks, we've been talking about those tough questions, the doubts, the challenges to our faith, what we do with them, how we handle them, move through them, and experience the seasons of spiritual drought and doubt. I told you over the last two weeks that it was an article handed to me that gave me such tremendous pause, and I lost sleep over it. I never told you who wrote it or what it was called, though. I'm now ready to reveal that information. I'm one of those folks that uh, scrolls through my news feed and I'll usually pick a, on a, some kind of article that says 29 things you can't do without in the kitchen or 13 things to do before you die. You know, and I'll just go, oh, they're numbered. That's helpful. I can check them off. This article was called 11 Ways That Religion Is Destroying Humanity. I thought, only 11? Just kidding. How did they get to 11? I'm like, I'm offended by the number. What does it mean that there's um, 11 enumerated ways that religion is destroying humanity? Or maybe I'm mad at the word destroying. Maybe I'm just totally offended because part of it just feels true. That, that there's some issues with how we've lived out faith, our religious hang-ups, the problems that we've had, the harm that we've done in the name of God that we shouldn't have done. Now, I don't agree that it's destroying humanity. I love my faith. I love religion. I love the Lord our God. I was up there in confirmation class just now. We were talking about the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I've owned it for myself. I've gone through my spiritual seasons of doubt. I've, I've asked these challenging questions of myself, and I feel like, like I'm just still growing like fruit on a vine. I'm just still ripening in my faith. I hope I don't fall off too soon or get frostbitten too early. I hope I could get to the point of being a mature Christian in faith. Or like John Wesley says, you know, are we moving on to perfection? Are we getting there somehow? But it is that once in a while I have to let go of the cocoon of all good things, faith in Jesus and church that I get to surround myself with like a warm blanket every week. And sometimes these arguments can penetrate in and just make me feel terrible. Because part of the 11 ways that the author wrote that religion is destroying humanity included, again, that we've created a series and a system of superiority, us versus them. If you're not with us, you're against us. If you're against us, you just ain't right. The justification, this is serious too, for inequality. The justification that we've that, that religion is, has done that excluding and demonizing others is somehow okay. That religion limits the ability of its adherents to ask questions and uses tactics of control and fear and reward and punishment to create a necessary pathway of obedience. So the author is saying that is inappropriate and only in a, in a context where questions can be asked can adherents learn to develop and understand the truth. And then, of course, the point that the author makes that's the hardest sometimes to reconcile is what is going on with a deity in religious texts that will advocate for or let destruction, harm, and death come to people um, in forms of punishment and smiting and 
destruction. And I look back at our Old Testament texts like you have and look for the answers of others who've come before me. Why, oh Lord, do these things happen? Why is this punishment so real and, and obvious? And it's in the course of obedience and disobedience and sin and not repenting. The story of Habakkuk, Job's testimony, Ecclesiastes, Jonah, where we see how God moves in and around in the faith lives of the people of the Old Testament. And always, though, there's this reclaiming and reconnecting and God faithfully present, luring and asking for and, and asking the faithful to come back. And then, and then, there's Jesus, the one sent to embody and the one incarnate in God's love, the one who demonstrates love so well that we're asked to emulate it and live it and, and be it for others. That he showed us the way to love and care for one another so perfectly and reasonably well that we can believe Jesus is who he said he was because the testimony of the truth of his life has endured and I think we're here and I'm here and you're here because we know and see beyond those questions and those doubts and those pains and the harm that's been done in the name of God. But still the goodness of Jesus prevails. Still the light of Christ rises above. But even when we don't get it right and in our sinfulness and in our pride and in our idolatry and even in, in the forces of evil and Satan and in the crushing weight of doubts, we ask the questions, how, Lord, can I go forward? Why am I being uh, caught up in this painful place of doubt? Where are you, Lord? But we take courage. We use what was read in the scriptures, taking courage and using our tools. We, we have the courage of our convictions. We have the courage of the use of tools that God laid out for us. And we have the courage to just keep trying. Now, the courage of our convictions is making a good argument, being ready to say what it is that you know you believe and why you believe it, having the words of the Spirit kind of on the tip of your tongue at any moment when you need it most. Remember that verse from 1 Peter Chapter 3, verse 15, it, it's, a, it's a testimony of the Holy Spirit within you, giving you what you need, confidence of the hope that's always available to you. The, all the necessary proof that you need is dwelling in you in the sheer power and presence of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that verse from 1 Peter 3, 15 says, um, regard Christ the Lord as holy in your hearts. Whenever anyone asks you to speak of your hope, be ready to defend it. I don't know about your readiness factor today. Maybe you're super ready with your armor of God and your fruit of the Spirit and your gifts of the Spirit. Maybe you're ready with John 3:16 at any moment. Maybe you're ready with your witness of just how you once were, but now you're no longer and you feel better because Jesus made it right. What is the witness and the hope that you have? And are you ready to speak it and defend your faith. You know, the Corinthian church gave Paul the most trouble. You just got to read both 1st and 2nd Corinthians to know that I think he stressed over them the most, the, just the most uh, problems and, and infighting and external forces on them. And even in this section in 2nd Corinthians, this is really Paul's defense of himself. The, the other self-styled prophets uh, were come along and say, don't pay attention to Paul. He'd rather write you a letter than be here. Um, don't pay attention to Paul. He's kind of puny and weak, and he's kind of the worldly flesh. You, you can't listen to what he says. He's ineffective. So Paul is making a defense of himself at this point and a defense of the authority he feels to be an advocate, an ambassador for Christ on a mission of his whole life and to share the good news of Christ. And so... You know, Michael read from the Common English Bible, that section of text that we heard this morning, and talked about the weapons that we have and, and the authority that, that's there. And, and I turned to the message translation, because you know sometimes you need the message, just give it to you straight. If you don't have a message, look on your phone app and just soak up those words sometimes, because here's what it said 
It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way. Paul, never have and never will, he says, and then he points out the tools of our trade. And in that version, Michael Ray, is the weapons that we have, God's weapons that we can use. You know, some of that language sounds harmful even, but here the message said, tools of the trade. So guess what they are? You've got, you've got prayer, faith, hope, love, scripture, and the Holy Spirit. You can say it again with me. Prayer, faith, hub, love, hub, love. You got to say the actual words, though, with consonants and separations. Prayer, faith, hope, love, scripture, and the Holy Spirit. The tools of the trade. These are tools disciples use to, to be all um, comforted and, and prepared in the hope that we have of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We've got our prayers, our faith, our hope, our love, Scripture, and the Holy Spirit. We can take courage that we can make an argument and grow in our argument and courage of our convictions at the use any time of those gifts and deploy them Build them up. You know, in that scripture, it said like, like they're meant to be used against fortresses to tear down walls, the walls that Satan puts up to keep people from believing. This is what Paul's opponents were, were getting and rise to, that he was saying those who opposed Paul portrayed him as weak and powerless, but he reminds the Corinthians and he reminds us that we have such strength and power. Because we have those tools and that authority to use them. When Jesus showed up and interrupted the history of the world, he brought all kinds of chaos and change with him. He wasn't following the rules and the commandments the same way they were used to them being followed. He wasn't the Messiah they planned that would kick out the Romans with this sheer conquering power. When Paul came along, he he didn't say the right things or speak as eloquently as others. He just didn't make the same sense as the other prophets of the time. It was just not right. Didn't fit. Didn't feel right for some folks. The persecution was on. But what he did and what they did, Jesus and Paul was demonstrate for us that faithfulness to the authority of the tools that they have and the ministry they've been commissioned to give. And that's what we can do to get through it, the seasons of doubt and the spiritual questions that we have and the challenges and the opposition. So use those tools and rely on the experiences of others who've been there and lived that. I don't know if you've heard of Dorothy Day. She was like Catholic Charities worker. I mean founder of some of the, the most important Catholic Charities movements. She, she didn't believe. She went through a personal crisis, and then she came to know the living Christ in her life and gave her life to the service of ministry of love to others. And she provided this quote for, for me and you to live by. Christians are to behave in a way that doesn't make sense unless God exists. What a great encapsulating statement of what it looks like to love as radically and as inclusively and as carefully and dramatically as Christ loved. That we behave in a way that somehow draws opposition and conflict and challenges to it. And we behave in a way that seems irrational to other people and we believe something that, that it is, speaks of the reward of eternal life and, and the way we live in love to get there, bring on the challenge. Because I get what she's saying. That's right. We're to be so different that it doesn't make sense unless God exists. There's a living pastor in, in New York City, uh, Judson Memorial Church, uh, the United Church of Christ. Her name is Donna Shepfer. Shepfer and uh, she's, she's opened her church to not just the regular worship services on Sunday and the regular folk, whatever that means, who come in the door. But there's a different worship service every day of the week. There's a worship service for the homeless, a worship service for LGBTQ community, a worship service for, for those who are addicted to drugs. There's a worship service just for those who um, are agnostic and atheist to come into the space and to learn worship. 
And, and her message that I picked up on this week was from a season of doubt and the challenges she faced of why are you opening the doors to all these people? Why are you living out that love and inclusion so radically and completely? And she just sort of put it out there in a just keep trying way. <clears throat> it takes a whole life to be a Christian. And you can unpack that chronologically. It takes every day I'm alive and walking on this earth to get there and be a Christian. Or you could say it takes a whole life. All the parts of me, the doubt, the stress, the worry, the trust, the hope, the prayer, the faith, and the continual seasons that come and go of spiritual drought. You know, Sadie was working on a project this week, a biography, a, a report. She chose a book about Mother Teresa. Now, there's a lady who had faith together her whole life, right? I was looking over the shoulder in this book, this sixth grade middle school biography on Mother Teresa, and you know what I learned? that after her death in her private letters, it was revealed that she struggled with feeling absent from God for 40 years. Did anybody, did you know that? I mean, I did not know that. She wrote in her letters that since 1949 or 1950, I have this terrible sense of loss, this untold darkness, this loneliness, this continual longing for God. Darkness is such that I really do not see neither with my mind nor my reason. The place of God in my soul is blank. For decades, she wrote that she felt that absence in her soul. And yet her work continued. Did she ever waver from the path she was on? Did she ever waver from that work? And really she didn't waver from her faith and belief. What she was saying was somehow she just felt separate from God. One of the final statements in the book was, I want only God in my life. The work is really and solely his. And what they got from her letters and her writing was that even when she didn't feel God's presence herself, she never stopped believing in him. It reminds me of the song that we sang. I borrowed the words here, this one. While I wait, while I worship, I'll worship in your name. While I wait, that sense of I'm not there right now. I've got this longing, this emptiness. While I wait for you, Lord, you are my strength. I'll trust you. You are the same. You are my strength. You make every scar. You make me whole. You are my healer. I don't know. I just take courage from that witness of Mother Teresa's life. I also heard another story about a pastor who grew up in youth ministry, grew up and decided to be a full-time pastor of a church, and he, he was leading a great congregation, and then all of a sudden these challenges to faith, these questions of, is this really all true, plagued him to the point, he said he suffered under that for two years, kind of faked his way through church, and then he resigned. And they moved into a tiny house behind his in-law's home, and he was just floundering along. And his wife said, let's go talk to this guy. It turned out they were going to talk to a kind of a modern-day prophet who said, three things are going to happen to you. You are going to take another church. You are going to need moving boxes, and you will have another baby. And he said, no, no, no. <laughs> None of those things are going to be true. He went home a week later, and his neighbor just came out and said, I have all these boxes. Do you need them? For no reason at all. And, and, and he's like, you know, maybe I do. Maybe. And then come along, got a phone call. The senior pastor at the church we resigned was retiring, and they, they offered him the position. He said, really, even though I, I don't feel it? Oh, we need you. And then turn around, and sure enough, what? Number three, and he said, these were all compelling and convincing things of God saying, I'm not done with you yet. This isn't over yet. I'm still in your life. But he said, it wasn't convincing, compelling, but not, not convincing. But then shortly after that, his mother passed away. He went to her home, was cleaning out the closets to move everything out. And he came across the puzzle that they used to put together. And he, he, he put it all together and there was one piece missing. It was kind of this green piece uh, and, and he couldn't find it. He looked through the closet. He looked through all the things, gave up, put the puzzle back, 
loaded everything on the U-Haul, took the U-Haul to the storage place, unloaded the U-Haul, was sweeping out the U-Haul, and what did he find? The one green piece of the puzzle. The one he couldn't find anywhere in the house, the one that was, wasn't meant to be, he thought. Why in the world was it at the floor of the U-Haul after everything else was gone? And he took that as the compelling, convincing piece that God had never left, that he was waiting and waiting for him to come back. The last piece of the puzzle fit together. And he came back full. It was as if that piece was just saying, just keep trying. The truth of God shall always be revealed. I was struck so much, and maybe you were, in, in what I read and heard this week after the passing of Elijah Cummings. And just in hearing things about his life and the way his fellow Congress people talked about him, the moral compass, the one always brings such a moral, clarifying, quick truth to any situation. And his life, I don't, I don't know how he did so much in only 68 years. And one of the things I didn't know until I heard it on the radio and I had missed it somehow in 2011. His nephew had been killed in a home invasion. They didn't know who did it. And he gave in part of the eulogy, and he said, I don't know what happened to you, and we never will, but we will never give up hope. So it's that hope piece I, I, I pulled from through the week. And as I continue to read about what he said and did, I, I came across this quote from him. My point, when he was talking to a crowd of people who were struggling in the community, he says, my point is that life will throw you some curves. Can anybody give an amen to that? And he said, you will go through some pain and you will be hurt at times, but you take your pain, turn it into a passion, and do your purpose. All right? Words to live by for sure. But he ended with this. I come by here to encourage you to be all that God meant for you to be. It is very, very important. To be all that God meant for us to be are to be the folks who give all that we can to respond to the kind of love that we know is real in him. And the kind of love that we've felt and have been changed by. And the kind of love that we know will get us through the pain, help us find our passion, and pursue our purpose. And I take note from, from this concept that I really want you to take home today. It's a Hebrew word. I learned it when we were at the Jewish synagogue with the confirmation class last year. I'm not sure if I can say it right. Tikkun olam. And we'll go with that. Is the Hebrew phrase for repair the world. And it's the idea that Jewish people have that they bear responsibility not only to take on their own moral, spiritual, and material welfare, but also for the welfare of society at large. That we, we give what we can no matter what kind of oppressive things have happened, injustices in God's name, and the things we perpetuate sinfully as people of God and do harm in the world, we still have the responsibility to do good in the world, to repair the world, to fix it in the name of God, to show the love of God. It is what should rise above all that we do. And that, and that God gave us Jesus to teach us how to love radically and how to respond to the injustices and, and, and grow away from them, evolve away from them. So that whatever 11 things religion's doing to destroy the world, we can do 12 wonderful things that will bring it back in God's name. That we can outnumber the injustices by the sheer number of efforts we make in doing the things we do to repair the world in the name of Jesus. So we ask God for courage, courage of conviction for the word of God on our lips and our hearts to reveal the hope we always have, to, to have the courage of, to just keep trying like the witnesses around us and the saints who've gone before us who gave everything for Jesus Christ. So give me courage, Lord God, and give me hope that passes all the questions until... Oh, Lord, I feel you filling up that darkness with your light. Whatever season of doubt you have, whatever absence you feel, know that Christ is, is waiting for you there. Christ is waiting for you there, I always will. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray.
Lord God, we thank you for those faithful servants whom we know and name in our hearts. We thank you for those who have demonstrated by their continued service and efforts to take courage and be of hope that we can develop and repair the world the way you need us to for your sake. That instead of destroying anything, we will build up. Instead of tearing down, we will defend. And that we will use the tools you give us of prayer and faith and hope and love and the scriptures you offer and the Holy Spirit within to lead us and guide us to a new day, a day of salvation and transformation. So give us each what we need by the measure of the Spirit today, what we need to go forward every day this week with a word of hope on our hearts. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.